Hello, everybody. People, this is so exciting. Yeah, you know, we, we had kicked this off in December um, back with a live audience, but we, we just had a very few couple of people. So it's it's good to see it looking, looking like it used to again. So thank you all for joining us. I know uh, we have a lovely bunch of people here today. We also have a lovely bunch of people watching uh, online. So all together, I think we had about 65 people for this one. So a uh, nice turnout. And uh, we're delighted to see the enthusiasm around this topic. So this is an uh, uh, important one. We like to bubble these up every now and then. So um, this is a good chance to explore a little bit more. My name is Kristen Jones. I'm president and CEO of the Indiana Health Industry Forum. We are the statewide life sciences trade association here. And in conjunction with our partners here at Barnes and Thornburg, um, uh, we want to welcome you today. Uh, unfortunately, Deborah Pollock Milgate, who is um, uh, my partner in crime up here, uh, she's not feeling too well, so she has stayed home and not COVID, just a headache. But um, uh, we wish her well and hope she'll be back with us for the next program. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, thanking everyone here at Barnes and Thornburg for their their sponsorship and support of this program, I also want to thank our sponsors today, uh, Novartis and Pharma. Uh, for their support. This is actually a combined program, um, our lunch program and our what is normally our legislative breakfast, but timing and COVID and uh, things can so it just seemed easier to have everything in one kind of kind of easy package. So um, uh, if you're here for one or the other, you, you get both today. So it's a twofer. Um, I also want to thank members of the Indiana General Assembly who have joined us. We had a couple who have registered uh, to learn more about what's going on with the industry here in the state and how to support it. And that is also a key goal of today's program. So we want to thank everyone um, uh, from the, the General Assembly who has been part of this program and, and joins us today. Um, just to get things going, I would like to introduce Christina Moorhead. She is the Deputy Vice President of State Policy with Pharma. She's here in Indianapolis, fortunately, and, and a, a local with us, but um, she's going to do just a quick welcome and tell you about an important piece of legislation that we're supporting uh, through the general, uh, through the session this year. So Christina, would you like? Thank you, Kristen. I echo it's so nice to be in a room um, full of people again. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Pharma, we're the trade association for the brand drug manufacturers. Um, we, of course, have a couple here in town and other ones across the country. Um, and we're proud of the work that our manufacturers do and really excited to hear about some of the work that they're doing here today. Um, so across downtown, the legislature um, has been working on a few bills related to uh, prescription drugs and pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're excited to announce the Indiana Senate has been working on a bill, Senate Bill 88, to help patients afford their medicines. So we know a lot of patients may struggle to afford their medicines, um, and that's a big policy that pharma and our member companies have been working on um, to make sure that medicines are affordable. So that bill does two big things. So for Hoosiers who are purchasing their insurance through the marketplace, it's going to ensure that those prescription drug discounts that a health insurer negotiates make their way to the patient. So today, um, those discounts may be used to um, decrease premiums or may be used um, for profit by the um, insurer PBM. So we wanna make sure that those discounts lower the price of prescription drugs, just like insurance lowers the cost of hospitals um, and doctor visits. There's another piece of that bill that some of you may find interesting for those who buy a fully insured plan. Um, this is to help employers understand the drug rebates that the insurers are negotiating on your behalf. Um, and so this is kind of an education piece that when you sit down with an insurer and you're talking about the plan, the insurer will have to tell you the amount of drug rebates they're negotiating for your plan. And then you'll have some options of how those drug rebates can be used. You could use them to lower your prescription drug costs. You could talk about how they could be used to lower their premiums or something else that could be health related. But what we've heard from small employers in Indiana um, is they were not necessarily even aware that they had drug rebates as part of their health plan. So we think that this will help them understand how they can employ, uh, lower their employee costs with the bill. And so without further ado, that's, that's our main bill for the year. Kristen, I will turn it back to you. Thank you for having us. Great. Thank you. Okay, much like Zoom, can you hear me now? Okay, I'm off of mute. That's important. Well, um, well, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Christina. We appreciate that update, and and we appreciate Pharma's support um, for programs like this, and uh, bringing more stuff, interesting bits and pieces throughout the course of the year. Uh, we have a great panel here today. I am so excited for this one. It's been um, it's been a lot of fun pulling everybody together for this. 
Uh, just before we before we introduce everybody and kind of dig in, I want to share just a little bit of background so we're all um, kind of on the same page about the industry here. Uh, it was probably two, two and a half years ago that we first really started noticing an uptick in uh, both the number of investments and the activity around the radiopharmacy and nuclear medicine field here in Indianapolis and, and Indiana broadly. Um, it has been a rapid growth since then, and it is projected to be a rapid growth for the next couple of years. So it's uh, an opportunity to highlight a really important subsector of the life sciences industry, one that's important here in Indiana, and one that we really want to understand uh, what they need to grow, uh, how we can support that, and what we can do as a community to, to help pull together and, and, and help make this uh, a success for the folks that are here and maybe bring some new ones in. Um, got a couple of slides just to put things in order here, if I can make this work. <clears throat> there we go. I, just to give you the background, I think everybody is pretty familiar with a lot of these statistics. Um, BioCrossroads just updated these a little bit ago, um, but we are an $84 billion life sciences cluster. So what that means is we are large, we are diverse, and we are impactful um, across the industry, whether you are in drugs, devices, health, IT, or any of the companies that service and support all of these businesses. Um, there are some 2,300 of them here in the state of Indiana. Uh, it, it makes us a force to be reckoned with. And um, even a small sliver of that, uh, when we look at the impact that the, the nuclear medicine field has here, uh, you will see it is a, a big chunk of this. Um, beyond that, uh, over 130,000 people directly employed by the industry uh, across the board. So. So again, at really high wages, these are the kinds of jobs that everybody dreams of having. Um, these are STEM jobs, they uh, pay well. I think the average, the average salary now is 102,000, um, uh, well, above, well above average and well above national averages. <clears throat> Excuse me. A uh, couple of things. Oh, sorry, it would help if I was on the right thing, sorry. Yeah, going backwards, I think. There we go. Let's try those. That looks a little better. My glasses is on. Um, uh, workforce, we talked about a little bit there. Uh, and uh, as far as research and investment goes, um, uh, Indiana is doing really well. We've had numbers in now, I think, from both uh, IU and Notre Dame. I think we're still waiting on Purdue's, but both had record years of funding with the National Institutes of Health and some of the research funding that they've had. So really important there. Uh, when we drill down a little more, if I can get these going in the right direction, there we go, that looks a little better. Uh, and we look at the distribution of the nuclear medicine uh, industry across the state of Indiana. We have 12 companies that are making these products that we that are, there we go, uh, that are, are, are in the manufacturing of isotopes, of, of things that help identify, diagnose, and treat a wide variety of diseases, most predominantly cancers. Um, but you'll see the things that, that make Indiana a great location uh, for this. Um, you'll see where they're clustered, you'll see where their service territories are, uh, and you'll see a whole host of, of uh, companies there, a lot of new ones that have just cropped up in the last couple of years. So, okay. 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 go in the wrong direction with some of this. So, uh, so what are radiopharmaceuticals? Uh, those are the products that are manufactured with uh, the use of, of looking at the people who can better explain this than me. <laughs> um, uh, they are compounds used, like I said, to identify, diagnose, and treat a wide. Okay, sorry about this. A wide variety of diseases and conditions. Um, uh, again, really important STEM jobs here for this. You know, you need a wide variety of disciplines. Chemistry is part of it. Physics, mathematics, computer technology, medicine backgrounds, all of these really important skill sets we want to highlight. Uh, and we also want to highlight that this is a very safe sector. This is a very regulated sector. Um, uh, every acronym you can imagine has a touch on this and, and then some. Uh, and uh, so these are really good, high quality, important jobs that are saving a lot of lives. And we'll, we'll talk a lot more about, about the impact there. Um, without too much further ado, I want to turn this over to our panel because again, they're, they're going to explain this a whole lot better than I am. 
Um, there we go. Right, people. Okay. <clears throat> Joining me today, last but not least at all, um, I have Kevin Hale. He is the site head with Advanced Accelerator Applications in the Novartis company. Is that how that goes? Oh, yes, if you could. Technical difficulties there. I'll finish introducing. No so problem. Kevin, <laughs> Kevin is here. Uh, AAA is one, if not the people who change your tires, as you mentioned, um, but AAA is one of the, the newest radio pharmaceutical manufacturers here in the state. And uh, we're here excited to hear about their experience here, uh, what they're finding, what they need, and how they're planning to grow their operations. We have Kara Weatherman, who is in charge of the nuclear medicine program at Purdue University which is one of only two in the Midwest. And uh, we're very excited uh, to have her here today. And Sarah Cheney with the Department of Homeland Security, who is in charge of overseeing and hopefully uh, uh, growing and helping pave the path for more folks like this and uh, uh, how we oversee nuclear uh, materials here in the state of Indiana. So without too much further ado. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Technical difficulties, change. Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you, and um, good luck with that. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll try to balance. There we go. Ah. So I, I'm going to introduce Advanced Accelerator Applications and Novartis to you, first of all. And, and we call it, we go by the name AAA a lot of times. And, and as, uh, as you just heard Kristen say, we're not going to come out and change your tire. So if you call us and your car broke down, we probably can't help. But I just want to explain a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, first of all, Novartis, a multinational large pharmaceutical company based in Basel, Switzerland, uh, about 120,000 employees worldwide. So, so put that, you know, get, get the scale of, of this operation. And in 2018, Novartis invested about $6 billion in two companies, the first of which was Advanced Accelerator Applications, AAA which was a European company based out, uh, actually that came out of the research done at CERN in Switzerland and was focusing on using targeted radio compounds to treat cancer. Uh, AAA had just launched a new product called Ludothera, which is for the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, NET as we call it. It's a very rare form of cancer, but they had developed a, a, a compound, I'll tell you how it works in a moment, that, that was, is successfully treating those cancers and giving patients a, a lot more hope for a, for a healthy and normal life. And later that same year, they purchased another company, some of you may have heard of, called Endocyte. Endocyte is a Purdue-based uh, research company that uh, has been around actually in the West Lafayette area for a number of years. That's actually where I came up from, and that's how I joined the company. And those two companies were combined together under the AAA name. Because Endocyte had a similar compound to Ludothera, but for the treatment of prostate cancer. And let me tell you a little bit about the, these compounds and how they work. You'll, you'll hear me talk about radio ligand therapy or RLT. Radiation has been used for a number of years, but back since the 50s to treat cancer. We know that radiation kills cells. The trick is, how do you get it to kill the cells you want to kill, like cancer tumors, and leave healthy cells alone? Well, radio ligand therapy uses a, a new concept to target the cancer cell. And the way this works is we can identify a structure, an antigen, a protein type structure on the surface or even internal to a specific type of cancer. You can call that a marker. Um, or another way to picture it is a lock, okay? We design then the chemical analog to that, a key to that lock that will only fit that lock and won't fit into anything else. To that key, we attach a keychain, and on the other end of that keychain, we put a radioactive atom. So now we can inject a patient with this product. This RLT will then travel through the bloodstream. If it finds a cancer cell, it locks in place. And when that happens, it stays there until the radioisotope decays, releases its radiation, in the case of the two products that I'm talking about, a beta particle. But when it releases that radiation, does that enough times, you kill the cancer cells. The, these type of radiation doesn't travel very far, very limited path 
uh, of, uh, of travel. And so because of that, it doesn't attack the healthy cells around it. If you inject the patient and say some of, some of these RLT molecules don't find a cancer cell, the kidneys wash it out, say, hey, you shouldn't be here. And within a few hours, the only drug product that you have in your system is attached to cancer tumors. So it's a very targeted way then to treat and kill and destroy cancer cells. And for the most part, leave healthy cell, cells alone. So you have lot lower side effects, a much better, uh, a much better chance of then destroying the cancer and, and not causing a lot of other health issues. And so today we have a product called Lutathera. It's on the market. It's treating neuroendocrine tumor patients. We have another product that's with the FDA awaiting approval for prostate cancer. And so what that meant is as we started looking at that marketplace, neuroendocrine tumors that we call it, or it actually got orphan drug status or orphan drug designation, meaning that, uh, you know, it's a very small patient population. And so the facilities that's required to make this are pretty small. But now you talk about prostate cancer, which is one of the leading cancer killers of men and actually one of the most common cancers and even, even a broad spec, uh, across, the, uh, across the spectrum. We knew we'd need more production facilities. So this is actually a picture of where AAA is in operation. You can see I mentioned that AAA was a European company. You see a lot of facilities throughout Europe. They're mostly involved in doing imaging, which is, is still very common and you know, is used in cancer to actually identify where the cancer tumors are. But then now we have some facilities, uh, one in Italy, one in Spain, and one in New Jersey that make the treatment compounds. And we're building a facility in Indianapolis. And why are we doing that? Well. I'm going to skip ahead to this slide first, and then we'll go back to what this facility looks like. One of the unique things about these kind of products is that there, there's no inventory. So a radioactive isotope decays, it, it, it disintegrates essentially, breaks down, releases its radiation on a, on a very predictable rate. And it doesn't matter what you do to it. You can freeze it, you can seal it, it doesn't matter. It's going to decay at the same rate all the time. So in our case, uh, the isotope that we're using for these compounds is a half-life of six and a half days. And if you do the math, that works out that every day, 10% of what you have disappears. So there's no inventory of starting material. And when you make the drug product, there's no inventory of that either. It's make the order. You essentially make it for a specific patient. So if you kind of think that through very quickly, what do you really need? You need a good distribution logistic network. You need to be able to get your raw material to your manufacturing site. You need to be able to get your product out to clinics around the country and around the world very quickly and easily. And so when we were looking, where do we put a site? Where do we build our manufacturing site? We knew logistics was number one. Number two is we needed a strong life science community so that we could recruit top talent. And, and number three, we needed a good business climate because we knew that this would, this type, these type of products, uh, I'm excited about it, if you can't tell, these type of products are going to grow very, very fast. And I think you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, as we go. So we need to be able to grow and expand very quickly. Well, Indianapolis and Indiana actually ended up at the top of the list. And so we purchased a site, some property right out by the airport, which I'll, I can back up here and show you in a moment. Um, one of the key things, Indianapolis, you've got the FedEx hub. So we've got the ability essentially overnight to be able to ship product and get it almost anywhere in the US within 24 hours. And these products have a shelf life of three to five days. So if you don't get it to a patient within three to five days, it, it's, you can't, it's not usable. So that was important. In addition to that, over half the US population lives within an easy day's drive of Indianapolis. And so that we know that we, even if we can't get out through the airport, we can even drive it. You have the strong life science base, which, which uh, we already talked about. And then on top of that, you've got the universities, both Purdue and IU, uh, very, very strong in, in life sciences. And you're going to hear something about radio pharmacy at Purdue in just a moment. And then, of course, the state is a very business friendly environment. And we've had a lot of support as we have tried to accelerate our construction project. And we really are very thankful to the state for working with us to make sure that we can move very fast and get a facility up and running. So that's what we're doing out here by the airport. If you've been to the airport in the last year or so, you've seen our, you've seen our, seen our facility. We're going I-70 West, and just as you turn off onto Reagan Parkway, to your left on the south side of the highway, that's where our building is. And you can see an artist rendition. I should have brought an update picture because it looks almost exactly like this without the landscaping right now. Uh, it's about a 50,000 square foot manufacturing space, highly expandable. We're gonna start with four production lines with the ability to expand 
add four more and even add on to the building. And we also bought some extra property so we could expand even further uh, if, the, if the need arises. So excellent uh, location. We're very excited about that. And we are hope to uh, have a ground, or not a ground, sorry, a uh, ribbon cutting ceremony sometime later this year as we uh, get up and running. Our, our plan right now is that we will be doing our, we're actually, the building is almost finished. We are in the stages right now of equipment qualification, getting the equipment shaken down, making sure everything works the way it's supposed to. Then we'll go through a process validation exercise and um, we still anticipate launching commercial product out of this facility after FDA approval sometime next year. On mute. There we go. Uh, thank you. That was that was tremendous. So you're projecting for the end of next year for production? I, or I hope it's earlier than that. Hopefully, you're, yeah. hopefully you're soon that. So so the key things there really are 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 large capital investments, mm -hmm. access to distribution systems, access to trained personnel, access to raw materials. Yep. Um, any other any other really? I mean, I, I could point out in there. Yeah, you know, the key raw material uh, is the radioisotope, and and uh, you know one of the things that concerns me today is looking ahead to how are we going to get enough of this manufactured. Uh, today we have one source in the U.S. and that's in Missouri. Uh, University of Missouri has a research reactor that makes these isotopes, and then we have our, our own source that that uh, comes out of Europe, which means we actually have to fly the radioisotope from Europe to the U.S. to uh, to then forward process it here. So looking ahead, I think it's very important that, that we identify and, in the, say, in the next decade or so, start working on some additional uh, forces for the radioisotope. In addition to that, um, just continuing to improve logistics and distribution. You know, I, I maybe even say but it'd be great to have a few more international flights out of Indianapolis. I mean, we can drive up to Chicago or DHL or whatever, but uh, boy, it'd be nice to have a few more international flights so we can get product out of the country if we need to. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, if anybody else has questions uh, on your table, you will find some white note cards. If you'd like to write your questions out and just wave it in the air, somebody will come around and pick it up and, and bring it up here and we'll try to work everything into the conversation as we go. Um, uh, Kara? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> With that, I will we'll flip that over to you. Um, uh, he touched a bit on the raw materials and the research reactor part, and I, I think you're planning to cover both of those. So. I, well, I will get a little bit of everything. everything. I think. Um, okay. So, um, so one of the, I, I would imagine that a large number of people in the audience and they basically anywhere, you say the word nuclear to most people, and that immediately brings up Chernobyl and and all of these very negative connotations. And you know, and, and I think as you kind of look forward and we look at, at the things that we're doing from a medical perspective, um, nuclear medicine, nuclear pharmacy has been around, like Kevin said, for a very long time. We use this routinely. Um, I ask my students every year at the beginning of my class, you know, how many of you have heard of x-ray and everybody's hand goes up? How many of you have heard of MRI? You know, hand goes up. And then I get to nuclear medicine and nobody has heard of that. And it, it has a very you know, specific place in treating patients and, and diagnosing patients and kind of looking at how we can improve healthcare for our patients. But the, the word nuclear routinely has a very negative connotation. And, um, and that's part of what Sarah gets to talk about is how do we make sure we do this safely. But, um, but really, you know, so I'm a nuclear pharmacist. Purdue University is one of the few academic institutions in the country that actually teaches nuclear pharmacy. So a nuclear pharmacist is the person that's the middleman between the manufacturer and the patient. Lost something there. Um, so for some some drugs will come directly from a manufacturer and and maybe come to me as a nuclear pharmacist. Maybe it'll go to the hospital. Um, but then there's another group of drugs because we're talking about these isotopes that have a very short half life. One of the ways that you can minimize radiation exposure and radiation dose to a patient is by giving them something that doesn't stick around for very long. And so a nuclear pharmacist, we deal with, with isotopes that have a very short half-life. So he's talking six days, I'm talking six hours, and maybe even down to 110 minutes when we actually are looking at how quickly our stuff goes away. So, um, so nuclear pharmacy is, is a very specialty area in working with radioactive materials. Um, I will tell you just from, from where we're positioned, 
like I said, Purdue is one of the only places that, that does this because we don't need a Walgreens in every corner type of mentality when you talk about nuclear pharmacies. Um, so, so not a lot of institutions specifically trained for this. But um, if you talk to many of my colleagues, both in the pharmacy world, but specifically in the medicine community, um, most of them will tell you as we move into this idea called paranostics, um, which I'll explain a little bit more in a minute, um, many of my colleagues say this is hands down the most exciting time to be in nuclear medicine in the past 20 years of, the, of these new drugs. and So I feel like I'm losing, losing voice there. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to call you back. <laughs> I can talk, don't you worry. <laughs> I, I spend my life yelling at students from across the room, so I'm, I'm okay with this. Um, but anyway, so, so as we look at this growth, you know, Indiana for us has always been um, kind of the, the area where nuclear pharmacy originated from. And so for us, the fact that manufacturing is now coming to Indiana and really taking up hold here. It's very exciting for all of us that are in this community. Um, let me step back really fast and talk about this idea of Theranostics. So Theranostics is basically, what, what really makes this unique is the fact that I can take a diagnostic imaging agent, meaning very little impact in, in once I put it in the patient, but I'm gonna put some radioactivity in a patient, those radiation is gonna come out of the body and we can put you under a camera and we can take a picture. And I can see exactly where these drugs go. I can see how fast they get there. I can see how quickly they move out of the body. We get a lot of physiologic information. So when we talk about you know, x-rays and, and ultrasounds and things, you get a lot of anatomic information. I can see what the organs look like, but it doesn't necessarily tell me how they function. So that's where nuclear is unique. We give you this drug that follows a pathway. We put a little bit of radiation on it, and then I can watch that by imaging a patient. So from a diagnostic perspective, pretty low radiation dose, you get very interesting looking pictures. Um, but when Kevin was talking about this concept of our labeled drug products and, and this targeted therapy, um, it was logical that if we had these drugs that went somewhere in the body and we could take a picture of it by replacing that isotope with now one that actually will irradiate and potentially kill a tumor cell, we kind of get a nice bang for our buck. So we image you, see where the tumor is. We give you a therapeutic version of that drug where hopefully it's going to kill off those tumors. And then I can come back and image you again and I can see how successful we were. Um, and so it, it's, very exciting as we look at this, as we're getting into prostate cancers and brain tumors and kidney tumors, and some of these things that traditionally were treated with chemotherapy. And I think most people know someone, if not yourself, who has experienced chemotherapy, and you realize that one of the biggest negatives of chemotherapy is it affects every cell in your body. And so you lose your hair, not because it's treating the disease, it's because the cells that are tied into your hair growth are impacted by this drug that I have to give you to try to control the growth of the tumor. So targeted therapy for us is really exciting because we can, like you said, cut down on side effects, cut down on all of those problems that are associated with that. Now, to where I get to talk about this, <laughs> um, one of the challenges is, though, I have to work with radioactive materials. So a big part of my job on a day-to-day -day basis is how do I get them together? How do I do the chemistry? How do I actually take this product from a raw material into a labeled drug product? And it's gonna be similar on a manufacturing perspective. So one of the inherent risks that always exists for someone who works in this field is we will be exposed to radiation as part of this whole process. And so thinking about how you do that, how you work and do certain things in the facility, whether it be manufacturing or pharmacy, but how do you do that with the nuclear twist is something that you just don't walk in and start doing. And so that's where from kind of our perspective, um, as you can kind of see on this slide, nuclear pharmacy, nuclear medicine and nuclear manufacturing all fit into a very regulated system. And I have a number of those on there. You know, the Department of Transportation, how do you put radioactivity on the road and take it to your end user? Um, you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and in some cases, the state that's going to oversee this so that I know when I'm working in there, I'm safe. 
Um, obviously, they're drug products, so the Food and Drug Administration have very distinct um, requirements that have to be followed. But how do you follow those requirements in a, in a typical drug product? I might make a drug product and it's going to sit on a shelf for three weeks while we go through the validation process to make sure it's safe to release for actual use. I, we don't have that luxury because our drug will be gone tomorrow, not in three weeks. So there's a lot of very unique challenges that go into this particular field. And it's important to think about it as that whole, but fundamentally, no matter how we look at all of this, it comes back to radiation and, and how do we work with and deal with radiation safely. And you know, I'm just going in exactly the same way you did. Um, so, so really where, you know, obviously Purdue is, is a key part of Indiana. We'd like to think that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a Purdue graduate. I should probably say that right from the get-go. So, um, so I have a very deep love of Purdue University, and then thankfully they now pay me to continue my love of nuclear pharmacy. So, um, but what what we have known, nuclear pharmacy has been around since the 1970s at Purdue. This is we we have done this for a very long time. And we are a feeder for a lot of the nuclear pharmacies that operate throughout the country. So again, not like Walgreens where you have one on every corner or CVS where you have one on every corner. A nuclear pharmacy, we have about 500 of them spread out throughout the country. Um, right now, I'm totally, this is a total plug, but more than half of the practicing nuclear pharmacists are Purdue graduates or Purdue related, yay. Um, so, you know, so we have this extensive network of folks throughout the country. But what's also interesting at Purdue, um, we have a very strong industrial and physical pharmacy group. And that industrial and physical pharmacy group is focused on manufacturing, drug manufacturing. How do we follow FDA requirements, the whole nine yards? Um, we have something we call the BSPS program, which is a Bachelor of Sciences in the Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, that's a springboard for industry for us. It's also a springboard for medical school or dental school. Um, they're not pharmacists, but they learn all the premises of pharmacy and the things related to that. Um, obviously at Purdue, we have an engineering group and that is the claim to fame for most folks in the engineering world. Um, but most people probably don't realize we have a whole section of nuclear engineering where we look at reactors and how we produce isotopes and how we can utilize isotopes in a variety of different ways. And so basically, if you look through all of these management, chemistry, Purdue University is just a central pot where we could really impact a lot of these different areas. And we already do in many different ways. But you know, what's really exciting now is the fact that this is coming to Indiana. And I think we have the potential to be a stronghold for providing a workforce that's going to come out and actually help contribute to all of these. But as you'll hear shortly, that have the training and the expertise in the handling of radioactive materials, which is what you have to have in order to operate safely. So, you know, I think as, as this has expanded in the state and things are actually kind of popping up here and there, this is a big thing that we're looking at at Purdue is to how do we unify and come together to actually create a workforce that is actually going to come out and benefit this as we go through. And, and, you know, I've mentioned a few, I've got a couple other ones on here, health physics, which are the folks that deal with most of the radiation safety. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different areas that you have to think about that doesn't just include, you know, manufacturing. So um, we're really excited to be a part of this. And, and hopefully as we move forward, we're going to get even deeper into this, um, talking about different training opportunities for our students, talking about um, obviously, long-term job satisfaction with our students and making sure they come out and have a great job, that they stay local. Um, and I, I think it's really an exciting component for us to see how this is really expanding. So it, very multidisciplinary training and, and application mm -hmm. within, within that field. And, and one of the things we always say that I don't know if everybody realizes this, you know, you can have a training program. But if nobody uses your training program, what good is the training program? So I, I think this is a, a unique opportunity for a place like Purdue, for example, to create that training program. And it may not be what we're doing now, but we always have the flexibility to adjust and meet the needs of what our constituents actually need. So, um, and it, so it's unique for us as well, which is very exciting. That's fantastic. You know, one of the th one of the statistics I keep running across um, as we're working on this is that the industry is expected to quadruple by 2025. And that that creates a whole set of issues and challenges on top of 
on top of just going to work every day and, and getting stuff done. But that that rapid amount of growth, um, uh, and particularly when we see it as concentrated as it is around resources, whether it whether it's the distribution systems, whether it's the workforce development pieces of it, that has huge ramifications for Indiana as well. Well, and, and you're looking across the spectrum. You know, we need the PhD level. Um, scientists and experts in their fields, all the way down to the operator um, that might be a BS student, it might be a, a, a two year degree, associate degree, it could be somebody out of high school. Um, you know, but these are all going to be very specific areas where very specific training is going to need to, to be looked at. And, you know, from a trainer perspective, there is obviously a difference in that spectrum. You know, how do you teach the PhD level student versus the high school graduate. Those are very different things that we have to think about. And how do you make a very complicated subject understandable for that whole spectrum is a very unique challenge. Well, it, it, along with that growth comes comes the need for regulation. <laughs> and uh, Sarah is with the Department of Homeland Security. She is, uh, as she gets her cell phone. <laughs> There we go. Back up. It's been a while since we've had to use the equipment, I think. <laughs> um, there, are, there are a couple steps and there are some ways that we can make uh, growth easier here and, and also uh, make it easier to work with companies directly here in the state. And I think Sarah has some uh, thoughts on how we, that can happen and what the process ahead of us might be. Um, so currently, Indiana has submitted a letter of intent. Um, we are in the process of becoming an agreement state. Um, if you are currently uh, in the radiopharmaceutical industry or anything else dealing with radioactive material, you probably deal with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and all the fun that comes with that, right? Um, your inspections, your licensing, your reviews, all of the good things that come with that, right? Um, including you know, taking 30, taking months to get a response or uh, it taking three or four days for somebody to show up on your campus because you had an incident, right? Um, so we'll go into this. So there are currently 39 uh, agreement states across the country. Um, of the 39 agreement states, 88% of the licensees in the country are, are under those agreement states. Um, so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does not actually license as many um, facilities, as you guys would think, um, a lot of their focus now is is transitioning from licensees because of agreement state process to nuclear power plants or to um, other federal things like DOD facilities and so on and so forth. Um, so Indiana is looking to become one of these agreement states. This process usually takes three to five years. Um, it goes through a series of steps. Uh, there are about ten steps on our side. If you look at the NRC steps they have about 22 uh, in the application process. The first one is the letter of intent, which Governor Holcomb signed on June 11th of last year. Um, and so, so far it's been a pretty uh, straightforward going through the process. Uh, we met with the NRC, we had them in town. It was a great two day session with everybody that you could possibly want there. Um, and now we are working on our legislative piece, which is currently going through. And all of that has to happen before we even begin to put together our entire application to submit to the NRC. All of that has to happen before we can do any rulemaking for regulations or adopt by reference or any of those things. So we're currently in step two, somewhere in step two for this process. Um, the benefits for the licensee is kind of Kind of what we talked about a little bit um, you guys now have really long times for reviews of your license or if you need to make an amendment you want to add somebody as an as an authorized user or as a need to change your rso your response time is is very long we currently have a license ourselves as the indiana department of homeland security and it took me three months just to get my rso changed after we submitted something to the nrc and that was calling every other day to be like hey have you assigned a license reviewer yet? Have you assigned somebody to, to look at my license? Like, hey, 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 I need this. I need this so we can do training things and so our radiochemistry lab can do things at the state level. Um, one of the things that the state is going to be able to offer is shortening those times. Um, if you have an accident, if you have an incident, if you need somebody on your campus, this is 
shortening that three or four day process to less than 24 hours. Um, our goal is to hire people and do regionally. So they are going to be within two hours of you, if not shorter. And these are gonna be people who live in your communities. You know, these health physicists are going to be people you may already work with or know. Um, the other thing is we're going to be trying to lower the licensing fees. So obviously you're not going to pay the same licensing fee you would for the NRC because we're gonna be able to do it a little more efficiently than they do. And we're not gonna have quite the overhead costs that the federal government has for everything. Um, we wanna make you guys a part of this process with us. So as we're going through the part of creating our, our regulations and, and what those are gonna entail, we want our stakeholders' opinions. We wanna be a partner in this process. Um, we're not here to be your, we're not here to be a dictator. We're not here to be the devil on your shoulder. We want to be a partner in this in your safety and the public safety um, and, and health care. So here's my contact information. Um, if you guys have any questions, if you have a concern, if you want to have a chat, uh, please feel free to email me, call me. Um, it may take me a little bit to get back to you, depending on how many phone calls or emails that is. Um, but we're willing to have these chats now, right? Um, and we want you guys to continue to be a part of this process. So there'll be public comment periods. Um, we're going to go out and do a campaign of outreach to everybody. Um, we want to make sure that you guys understand that the, the Hoosier Health Physicist Society, that the yeah, Purdue and IU and um, Eli Lilly and in Point Biopharma and all these people that we've already started to talk to, we want everybody from every business level to be a part of this process with us. We, we are here to be a partner in this, not an authority. Sarah, real quick, like, could you can you touch just on sort of where things stand with, with Senate Bill 381? Yes. So we currently went through the VA and Public Safety uh, Committee this morning, and we got through it with uh, 10 to 0. Um, so there were a few, a few comments from the legislators, but um, overall, it's been a pretty positive bill. Um, sponsorship has been positive, um, and it's on its way. I believe it's going to be going into maybe weights and measures next, and then hopefully we'll just be good to go. That's fantastic. That's uh, we're uh, that's a bill that IHIF is interested in and has supported. So we're we're happy to see it move and happy to happy to have tools that help support companies and their growth here in the state for sure. So one of the things, Kevin, that you mentioned, and and I think um, uh, the chair was going to touch on as well. Uh, is the need for a research reactor and what a role that could play in both adding to additional materials available and and expanding some of your capabilities. Both of you maybe want to touch on sure. that. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple of comments. Oh. They, so the radioisotopes that we use in the manufacture of these drugs come from a research reactor. It's a nuclear reactor that's not designed for power, it's designed to focus neutrons on a target. And then you essentially irradiate that target and then you purify what comes out of it to get your, your isotope. Uh, currently in the US, there's one commercial that, that's making commercial product and that is the, the uh, Missouri University Research Reactor in Columbia, Missouri, about five-ish, five to six hour drive from here. Uh, the only other reactor in the US that's capable of doing it on a larger scale is actually owned by the Department of Energy at Oak Ridge and as you probably might, you know, could, could imagine, we can't guarantee that there'll be a supply out of that. So as we look at, at not only AAA, but other companies also developing these kind of compounds, we, we fully expect that, that MER is going to be challenged to keep up. In fact, there's going to be, be a need for, uh, for a, a, another research reactor somewhere in the U.S. Um, in addition to that, just to, to paint the picture, we're, I already mentioned that you know, we have a, a supply out of Europe. And really, Russia is where a lot of these isotopes come from, especially in the developmental stages. And I think you guys are all aware of the political climate. That's probably not a place we want to be dependent on. So if I put something on my wish list for the next several years, it'd be awfully nice to have something close to our location. Because again, transportation time is, you know, time is money, but it's also critical if you get weather or whatever, that you could get your product to your manufacturing site and, and then get your drug product out to, to, the, uh, to the patient. So it'd be awfully nice. And I personally, um, I'm also a Purdue graduate, so I have to give that <laughs> caveat. I can't imagine a better university to work with. The one that has the top nuclear pharmacy program and the, one of the best nuclear engineering programs. Yeah, so, um, so one of the other things to think about that 
you know, there's a, there's a production need. And as these drugs are coming out and coming to market, obviously there needs to be a stable supply of isotope. But one of the major concerns as we look through this as well as looking at the long-term future of this, if we've got manufacturers who are using the isotope supply, then the researchers and the folks that are doing some of the early stage work to develop these new radiopharmaceuticals are struggling to get isotope as well. And so, you know, fixing the supply issue will also help continue the long-term development stage. And, and I should also point out reactors. So we're, we're talking about nuclear reactors. So fission or nuclear activation where you can actually make something radioactive. And I, I think that's also an important designation that everything we use in people for nuclear medicine, whether it's therapy or diagnostic, are considered to be man-made isotopes. So it's not that you go dig in the ground and you pull it out and you've got radioactivity. We actually make everything. So a nuclear reactor is one route. Um, we also do cyclotrons and accelerators, which is another route of going through this. It's just that, you know, you can't just pick one thing and make it. You know, there are a lot of things that go into this. And so looking at how we stabilize this supply um, it's not just going to be a reactor, although that's a huge need, but we have other companies in Indiana that are focusing on accelerator and cyclotron based development that also are going to be bringing out isotopes that we may be able to start using. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, any use of radio pharmaceutical has to have a solid supply of materials before it's going to be successful. So, and, and if you look at some of the data on some of these drugs that are coming out, it's impressive. Um, one of the, the best parts about teaching it is that you can show a picture of a before and after, and you know exactly how well the therapy worked. And, um, you know, you look at some of these things that are patients that are basically have failed every other type of therapy, and we have no other options who do amazing after they actually get some of these targeted radio pharmaceuticals, which is what makes it very exciting. But I think, again, if you're going to support the manufacturing side of what we do in Indiana, there has to be consideration for the isotope supply as well. And I just added, that's not a short-term answer. You know, it's not something you can start building tomorrow. You know, it's going to take quite a while and, and quite a bit of effort and cooperation across government, academia, and industry to, to accomplish this. And, and just to clarify, the NRC would still regulate anything that's nuclear reactor. Until it becomes a byproduct or leaves that facility, then it would be uh, more of an agreement state issue, or if it's a waste or anything that happens at the facility once that the radio pharmaceutical is there. I uh, just want to make sure everyone understood that. And as somebody who also teaches about all the regulatory aspects of this, um, this is highly regulated. I mean, I can't even begin to explain <laughs> how highly regulated this world is um, because of the, obviously, the, these are all drug products that we're going to put into a patient, but the radioactive component on top of that just leads to more regulatory oversight than most people are actually used to dealing with. So from a safety perspective, you know, if he's building his facility next door to your facility, um, safety is not a huge concern because all of the things he has to do to get that to actually go into fruition and get approved have already assured the fact that the general public is going to be safe in this process. So he's been asked every uncomfortable question he could exactly. possibly never want to answer before he was even issued a license or uh, entertained. Yeah, so let, let me comment on that real quick because <laughs> that's important. Safety in, in this industry is extremely important, and at the same time, you know, while this is something to be respected, we don't need to be scared of it. To, to put it simply, if we do our jobs right, our employees, who are the ones at most at risk, our employees don't get any, any more exposure, at least on the order of a magnitude of, of say, an airline pilot or a flight attendant. Mm -hmm. so, so they're not being exposed to large quantities of radiation. We're measuring everything. Um, to put it in perspective, when we ship a drug product, it's in a, about a one cubic foot box. And that box has a, a lead container in it, and then it's got packaging materials and all. It's designed under DOT regulations that it can be dropped, I think, from 10 feet without breaking. And, and then on top of that, if you were to take a, 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 a Geiger counter and, and sweep it over the outside of that box, you would detect absolutely nothing. You know, it's a white label box is what we call that. So it's, it's very safe to handle it when we do our jobs correctly. And that's, that's why we have all the regulation, the oversight. That's why it's important to partner with, with uh, academia with with uh, with the government to make sure that that not our employees are safe the community safe people on the on, you know at the airport don't have any issues etc 
I like to tell our students when I ask the question about, do they know x-ray? Do they know all of those things? If you don't know about us, then we're probably doing our job perfectly well <laughs> yeah. um, because we're not in the news. We're not, you know, that's what we want. Um, but we want to make sure that we continue to have the ability to, to do this supply in a way that, um, you know, make sure everybody stays safe. And unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know, fortunately for me, um, a, a large part of that is the training and the preparation of folks that are entering the workforce. And so if we can get well-trained people out into the workforce, then that's a lot less work that we have to deal with, with making sure they maintain that safety level. Uh, a couple of questions from the audience here. I'm gonna, gonna condense a couple of these, I think. Um, uh, understanding that that right now, so, so a lot of a lot of these products are very personalized it made to order for each patient so it's sort of the, the cutting edge of personalized medicine that we've all been waiting to hear about and talking about for years and years and years now um uh as you're as you're looking ahead to other things you can do with this within this space what are some of the sort of the leading edge kinds of applications you're seeing for this? Are there, are there new um, technologies that are coming into play in any of this? Are there new treatment methods or delivery methods for any of this? I, the, one of the questions here um, was somebody who's trying to, trying to better understand um, how maybe the diagnostic piece of this works, um, uh, but how, how these products are delivered into people. And I presume most of it is intravenous and, and then flushed through. Um, uh, but they're also interested in uh, the ability of um, how do you extend the shelf life? How where is research going that might might make that more? How do you are you able to manipulate that process? I think is where they're going to make it longer or shorter. I'll start only because um, the, it's the easy answer. No. Um, <laughs> so 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 radioactive decay is you can't change it right um, you can't freeze it you can't do anything and and that's where are the challenges in a lot of what we do because you want something that when i actually put it in the patient's body that it's not going to cause an excessive amount of damage that we're not looking for right we we want it to, to deliver radiation to where it needs to go but we want to make sure that the rest of the tissues are have very little radiation dose to it so a short half-life for diagnostic purposes is great. Um, we put it in, you take a picture and it goes away. That's what we like. On a therapeutic side though, we want something that lasts a little bit longer so that it gets there and then it just irradiates over time. And you know, it may not be, you're not gonna feel better tomorrow, but in two months or three months, I've delivered enough of a radiation dose that that tumor is no longer functional. Um, so, so we have to make that balance, right? There are a ton of isotopes that have longer half-lives. It's just, we have to deal with the chemistry side of it. Can we incorporate it into a drug? Can we figure out how to put it in a drug but not change the way the drug behaves when we actually put it in the patient's body? That doesn't help us a bit. Um, and, and so it, it's a fine balance. Are there other isotopes? Sure. Um, and maybe we have to figure out what that mix is. Um, but that it's a mixture of the physical half-life, the biologic half-life, and what we call the effective half-life. Um, those all have to be figured out in order for any of our drugs to be useful. So it's a challenge to come up with something. I can't just say, nope, I'm going to set it here on the shelf and, and hold it for another three days. But that also creates some regulatory requirements, right? The FDA is not going to let you just release a drug for the fun of it because, you know, that's not how it works. But how do we do all of the things the FDA wants us to do without you know, w without actually doing what they want us to do because of the limitations of our half-lives. And I think if you look at the regulatory climate over the last few years, um, we've had a lot of changes where people are saying, I get what's going on, here's the product you're making, and maybe we don't look at the product, we look at the process. And so if you have the process in place and the manufacturing CGMP components in place, then you've got a drug that we can say is is safe and then we validate it maybe a little bit after the fact. I mean, there's a lot of things that come with working with radioactivity that you don't see in traditional drug manufacturing. And, and we have to just figure out how to work around those limitations. Yeah. I'll just add a great, great explanation. It is very complicated. And if you, anybody here can come up with a way to extend the half-life of an <laughs> isotope, I guarantee a Nobel prize. Uh, it, it would be fantastic, but there, yeah, there is none. Uh, 
this is a personalized medicine and not in the same sense as say CAR T or, or, or uh, gene therapy where you're actually taking something from the patient and modifying it. But in our case, we, we, we get an order for a, a dose for a patient. And with that order is the patient is scheduled to be dosed on say Tuesday at, at 10, 10 a.m. Central time. And we have to calibrate that dose. So we don't, it's not like we just make, you know, a hundred vials and just ship one. We actually calibrate that dose so that when the patient gets it, it's the right amount of radiation at that time. So it's like we're calculating ahead. What is it going to be when the patient gets it? We fill it on the manufacturing line to match that. So it is very personalized. And I will just say that for me personally, that, that's exciting. You know, I, we're making a drug product and we know, we don't know names, of course, but we know that vial is, there's a patient waiting for it. And that's, somehow it's more rewarding and more exciting than when you're making, you know, thousands and millions of tablets and it's going into a warehouse somewhere and then will eventually get distributed. Not that that's not important and not that that's not good, but this is very personal. And um, just to throw in with the whole physiologic aspect. Um, so PSMA is, is not only being used for a therapeutic purpose, but we use it now and there's FDA approved products for the diagnostic side of things. Just to give you some scope, um, so if you have a, a male that had prostate cancer and has been treated for it, we follow your PSA. That, that's very personalized. It's your PSA. But what happens when the cancer comes back, your PSA starts going up. And we know something's going on because your PSA is going up. If we took your prostate out, for example, you shouldn't have PSA levels going up, but it is. So we're, we're inclined to think that there's probably a reoccurrence of disease. If I put you in a CT scanner, I'll probably see nothing. If I see in an MRI, I'll probably see nothing. Heck, even our nuclear medicine bone scan, I'm not going to see anything probably until your, um, your PSA level gets up near 10. That's usually kind of our threshold. So you're sitting there waiting. You know that something's going on, but I can't tell you what that is because you haven't reached the threshold that our current technology is able to identify it so that we then know how to treat it. So these, the PSMA, as an example, um, PSMA will show up with a PSA level of about one. So now I've got a patient who has a rising PSA and I can diagnostic dose of PSA in you, PSMA, and I can see where that tumor is. And it's much easier to surgically remove one reoccurrent tumor than to wait until you have 200 of them spread all over your body. So when we say nuclear is very personalized medicine, you know, we're looking at each individual person and you know, and, and in this case, you know, this is where the therapeutic PSMA comes in. So let's say it is a little too far for me to go in and surgically remove one tumor, but now I've got something that will go to all 10 of those tumors that you have in your body and direct application of, of therapy. Um, you know, a patient like that might not get radiation therapy. We all know radiation therapy, but I can't irradiate a tumor if it's sitting over your heart because the damage to your heart is going to long be a bigger problem than fixing your tumor. So, you know, these are, these are challenges that this particular area of medicine is really looking to overcome and, um, and provide a very different treatment algorithm for our patients, diagnosis and treatment algorithm for our patients. Well, great. Well, we've, we've reached the end of our hour. Um, uh, we do have someone here who has volunteered to, to let Mitch Daniels know if, if we need to, that you should have a research reactor. So, we should all go out and lobby for that one and, and boiler up. Let's, let's start, start with a, let's start with a permanent job. That goes good <laughs> here. And then we can go after that. We'll we'll work on building it up from there. Um, but certainly something that uh, is a concrete, tangible thing that will help uh, help grow the industry and, and help support the folks who are already here. So so thank you all. Um, we appreciate your time today. Thank you all. It is great to see people here again. Um, and to everyone watching from home, uh, we hope you will be able to join us again in the future. Um, we have a program, I believe, on CAR T therapies planned for March. So we will we'll bring you some more information on that shortly. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you very much. Have a great day, and uh, we'll see you in see you in March. Thank you. <laughs>